And joining me to discuss her thoughts on the week is Minority Leader Ilana Rubel. M Minority Leader, thank you so much for joining me today. I, you know, we just had a lot of conversation about the new budget process and the new budgets that that did pass. Your caucus, the Democrats in the House, um, and your colleagues in the Senate, on some of those budgets were the only ones to vote no, including on on budgets you've traditionally supported, you know, like State Board of Education, public schools, you voted no. Why was that? Uh, these budgets are not real, what they call maintenance budgets. They've been sold as maintenance budgets, which are supposedly budgets that will, you know, meet the basic needs and keep the, 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 the agency functioning, and then they'll address the extra line items later. That is not what's going on here. These budgets that are being sold as maintenance budgets are, are not even skeleton budgets. For example, the education budget we voted on today um, is nearly a 10% cut to the public education budget. It does not include statutorily mandated items like the teacher raises under the career ladder, benefits packages, necessary funding for the school of deaf and blind. Um, it's, it's a disastrous budget, but once it's passed, um, it opens the door to a lot of mayhem. It opens the door to the potential that we just leave the building and adjourn uh, eventually at the end of March or something and someone says, well, we passed the education budget. What's the problem? We can leave now. It also represents a profound shift of power. We've never had a system like this ever. We've had a very well-working system of budgets for decades that has been completely upended this year and has never been tried before. And we're taking a leap off the cliff and I was not ready to jump off that cliff and hope that there's a net down there. Um, what they they basically did is they handed absolute power to the speaker who's oh my he's my friend but they just made basically the speaker almost more powerful than the governor with this move of passing these skeleton budgets because what that means now is when the other stuff comes in the meat on the bones the actual pay teacher pay the actual you know having people to run the department of health and welfare all of these things the speaker doesn't even have to hold those for a vote. He has one man power to send any of those budgets to the Ways and Means Committee and make sure they never get voted on on the floor. So for example, launch funds, which the speaker opposed, those are now carved up and left hanging in the wind. They're not part of the core budget for any of these agencies. Um, so it has empowered one person to basically block just about any funding for any agency. Um, just in terms of balance of powers, I have serious concerns about that. Um, but we just opened up a really soft underbelly in terms of whether any of the basic functions of the state get met, whether any of those 10,000 kids that just applied for launch uh, grants to go to college and pursue training and welding and you know, electrical engineering, all these things, whether they ever get that money, just became in very serious doubt with this new JFAC process and with the decision on the Republicans' parts, even those who have grave doubts, to just hold their nose and go along with it. Shouldn't lawmakers, though, be able to take a look at the meat on the bones and really examine those budgets? I mean, that's, that's how this was sold, as, as a new transparent way to look at the new spending. Yeah, no, they always could do that. I mean, that, that was always the case where they always had all the items in a budget. The difference is that before you would see the budget as a whole. And when you got the education budget, you got to look at everything in it, but you would actually look at the whole education budget and say, okay, these are all the things that are going into the education budget. We're gonna hear from the head of the Department of Education. We're gonna ask her questions on it. It was actually very transparent. Now, um, the head of the, sec of the Department of Education even, isn't even allowed to come in the room and make her case. Uh, she has been barred from it all. She's not part of the question making process. I think that's an interference with transparency. Um, but right now we have absolutely no idea. We don't even know what the, the target revenue is for the state yet. We, 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 they did this budget in a vacuum. The committee wasn't even involved in these baseline skeleton budgets. It was just done by the chairs. Um, and uh, the budget was passed without any clue as to what the whole is going to look like. Uh, so it's kind of like, well, you know, you're going to start painting this wall without really knowing how big the wall is, what the house looks like, what the other things are in the room, <laughs> what the furniture is, what any other color <laughs> of any other wall is. Um, so I don't think that's more transparent. I don't think that operating in a total vacuum where you have no insight into how the pieces are going to work together, um, that feels to me far less transparent. And to just take a leap of faith that when you pass this little itty bitty budget, it's somehow all going to come together in some big hole that works. Before we saw the big hole and we got to see the big hole and made sure that it worked before we voted on it. Uh, that is the opposite of what we're doing now. Thursday's leadership vote was mostly a Republican inner caucus fight, but from your perspective, how might this affect the rest of the session? 
Um, I think it's going to have some, we already saw it have major repercussions on the floor today. Um, yesterday, we had a vote on one of these maintenance budgets, and a lot of folks in that building have very serious concerns about this process and the content and the fact that these budgets are not, in fact, maintenance budgets, that they represent grave cuts that are going to seriously cut the services that people in Idaho cut on, uh, uh, depend on. And yesterday, 31 people were voted against that budget. It was very close. It barely passed. Then they went into caucus. They fired the uh, majority leader who had voted against that budget. She was part of that crew that expressed concerns and that voted against that budget. Uh, they went in. They ousted her. They came out. Um, and it was a very different feel on the floor today. All of a sudden, all of the people who had opposed it yesterday were just, you know, kind of bending the knee. They were saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll do what I'm told from here on out. I'll never vote against these things again. And we had this education budget come out, which, again, nearly a 10 percent cut to the education budget with very basic needs not met. And just about all of them voted for it. So we saw a night and day difference between one day they were willing to stand up and say, I have real concerns. I can't vote for this budget. Then there was the ouster. Next day they come in and basically are like, OK, I'll do whatever majority leadership wants. Uh, so um, that concerns me because, you know, I think I want to be in a place where people can vote their minds and vote their consciences. I think that does that does the most good for the people of Idaho. And frankly, as Democrats, we always have to work across the aisle and um, we, we work and it's not necessarily with moderates or with one subset or with the far right. We'll work with anybody and sometimes we form unexpected coalitions. Um, but it's going to be a lot harder to make good things happen for the, the people of Idaho if the members of the majority caucus are, are cowed and feel like they can't step out of line and, you know, necessarily do the things that they would like to do and that they feel are right. We have about 90 seconds left, but you have your own legislative priorities that you lined out at the beginning of the session. How is this going to change your approach to getting Republicans on board for for those priorities? Well, I mean, we're going to keep doing what, you know, fortunately, I'm very happy. We don't have the num we don't have the numbers that I would like, but at least we always get to vote our consciences and we, we don't have a woodshed in our caucus room. Uh, but <laughs> we, uh, you know, we will continue to make the case the best we can. We'll make it to the people of Idaho. We'll make it to the legislators in the building um, and we will see what the outcome is this session. I mean, I think the people of Idaho are not going to be happy if we emerge from this session uh, with no functioning schools and without a functioning Department of Health and Welfare and without a launch program and without you know, any of the, the things that they count on. Uh, and so we will make that case at every turn. And if we don't get those things, we will make our case to the voters at the ballot box in November. How are you feeling about your priorities at this point in the session? I'm really concerned about some of those priorities. I mean, I'm very concerned about launch, which passed by one vote last year with the majority of Republicans voting against. This is a transformative program that opens up incredible pathways of opportunity to potentially double kids' income. Um, and I'm very concerned. You know, it was a minority of, Dem of Republicans last year who sided with the Democrats to do that. Um, if they don't feel comfortable doing that anymore, launch may die. And we're um, going to have to leave it there. Oh, but yep. We're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for watching. We have so much more on what happened this week online, including a new school facilities bill. Lots of details there. You can find all of that at IdahoReports.org. We'll see you next week.